seminar series. And I had a few things to share before we move on to the, um, the highlight, which is Jerry Richmond and her talk. And I'm gonna share a screen and hopefully this will work. Good. Um, so first big piece of news from Fizz is after, there we go. After many decades, we actually have a new 21st century webpage. And the URL is fizz-acs.org. And um, it's wonderful. And we should thank um, QC and um, Lori Good for really making this happen. Um, we also are going to cont be continuing on through the summer with this seminar series, which is um, co-sponsored by Phase Tech. Um, after this week, we're going to move into a second and fourth um, Friday of the month schedule and highlight our award winners for the division. Um, the first one being, I've got way too many windows going on here, but the first um, one being um, Emily um, Ringa, who's going to be giving the talk an hour earlier than usual because she's logging in from the UK and she's our JPCC lectureship awardee that will be May 14th. And then moving forward from that, we'll have um, seminars every other week back at this usual noon Pacific time, um, 3 p.m. Eastern time, um, moving on to Nancy McCree um, at UIUC and, from, and moving on from there. And this has, I think, been a great um, gift from Phase Tech to allow this to happen. And we just appreciate everyone's um, support of this um, program over the past um, nine months or so. And so I know that you're not here to listen to me talking about the great things that are happening in Phys, but for today's talk, and so I'm going to turn this over to Christy Landis, who is um, the vice chair, the vice chair of the Phys division, to um, move us forward. Thanks, Anne. And I'm not going to take up a ton of time, but it's my job to introduce our wonderful speaker today, Professor Geraldine Richmond from the University of Oregon. Um, now, the first thing you need to know is that I couldn't even begin to talk about all of her honors and awards because that would take up the whole time. And so if you don't know about them, please Google her and you can find all of them. But I will just tell you a few little tidbits. Um, she's a Kansas farm girl um, who then went to Berkeley for her PhD. And then she started her career at Bryn Mawr before then she moved on to the University of Oregon to start just a, a wonderful career um, in surface and interfacial science and spectroscopy. And uh, she has had all sorts of contributions um, on the, the orientation of all sorts of molecules at interfaces. And she's gonna tell us about some of that today. Her scientific accolades are long, but she's a member, uh, a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences. She's a former president of AAAS. I think that's correct. Um, she's been all sorts of presidential advisories. And then in, in terms of the ACS, she's won the ACS's highest scientific honor, the Priestley Medal. Um, and so that's just a couple of the things that, that she's really earned for her scientific uh, and mentorship and outreach activities. And so it's really an honor to um, get her time here, to get her in one place at one time. To, to be able to give us this talk. So thank you, Jerry, for doing it. Um, and so you can go ahead and share. Okay, thank you, Christy. Okay, let me get started. Oh, and for everybody else, we will curate, we'll put this in the chat. We're gonna curate questions in the chat for Professor Richmond, and um, we'll ask all the questions at the end and we'll give you instructions by chat on how to do that. Okay, uh, can everybody see that? Yeah, are we okay? Okay, great. Okay, well, it's a pleasure for me to be uh, with you here today. Um, I'm calling in from my greenhouse in uh, Eugene, Oregon, uh, so that I can get some vitamin D build up while we do all the Zooming stuff. Um, it was such, an, such a delight to get the email from Anne and, and Christy to invite me to do this, because in the, the world we're in now, it's, it's, um, you feel some, quite disconnected, and to connect with you today is really a, a pleasure. I want to share with you uh, some of our recent results that I'm very excited about. Um, and as many of you may know or, or not know, uh, we've been working on doing the, uh, trying to understand the interface between oil and water, also air and water, uh, for many years. And so this talk uh, is specific to that uh, first one having to do with oil water interface. And uh, that's what I wanted to share with you uh, today. So let me uh, get started here. 
So emulsions, uh, so this relevant to emulsions, so the nano emulsions I'll talk about, um, these emulsions are pervasive in the world uh, and we know them. In my group, we tend to like to focus on areas of science that have an environmental side to them. And so certainly that's the case for oil spills, oil slicks in order to clean up an oil slick you have to put some kind of a dispersant on there that causes the oil to break up into little tiny droplets and uh, uh, stabilized by the dispersants and then uh, go off, uh, dissolve, not dissolve away, but certainly disperse out into the ocean or fall to the bottom of the ocean. It's not an ideal situation at all, but it is a, a primary way these days that we have to clean up these horrific uh, disasters that occur, uh, for example, in the, in the Gulf of Mexico recently. And, uh, but the problem is these dispersants uh, that they put on that break it up are really disgusting. They're really disgusting. And in fact, they're as toxic as anything else. And so trying to find something that will encapsulate that oil and be able to easily wash it out uh, into the ocean and not kill everything in its path uh, is what we um, have the kind of the motivation behind some of our work. But we also like ice cream and we know that ice cream is an emulsion uh, and hand lotion is too. Um, and so, uh, but not quite so familiar with everyone is the uh, application that it has in, in medicine for nanomotions. And that is that the nanomotion becomes a carrier for drugs. And so it allows that the, the uh, putting the, uh, the medicine inside, uh, inside of that nanomotion can then transport it to where it needs to go uh, for its utility. And so nanomotions are, are very, uh, very much widespread, but it's really, uh, all, they're really new entrants to this whole field of emulsions, uh, new instruments in, entrance into this realm of emulsions, not only for their uses, but in particular understanding their very fascinating uh, properties. And we, uh, because we've been studying the planar oil water interfaces for, for many, many years, we've always wondered how it would relate to an emulsion uh, surface in general where you have an oil and water now in a, in a sphere encapsulated. And so when Sylvie Roki, who really uh, did just amazing and still continues to do pioneering work in this area, um, developed the technique for doing spectroscopy at these nano droplet surface, we were very anxious to learn from her so that we could start to answer the kind of questions that we've wanted to know for many years with regards to the applicability of what we're learning at a planar interface relative something that's a droplet. So these nanomotions that I'm going to talk about have diameters somewhere around Ferrar, there's somewhere around ours that I'll talk about, there's somewhere around 300 to 600 uh, nanometers. They are kinetically stable and they are dispersed in the uh, aqueous environment. And this, this but the sta stabilizing them usually requires some type of uh, surfactant or polymer. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that because it's relevant to, uh, to our interest in understanding stabilization too, not just how uh, water and oil interfaces at a droplet differ from when you have a planar surface. Because there's some different energetics here. So in the planar, for this uh, planar oil water interface, you have a thermodynamically stable uh, interface. But then you, to get to make your nano motions, you need to put energy into that system. And in our case, we do that with ultrasonification. So you sonicate it. And then you form something, this dispersion that's kinetically stable. So it's in a very different energy state. Now, uh, it then, uh, depending on how you're stabilizing those droplets, uh, with a surfactant or a polymer, um, they then can eventually uh, go by coalescing, the droplets coalescing, for example, uh, getting bigger and bigger and bigger, then you go back to the planar uh, thermodynamically stable interface. And so uh, what, what I'm really curious about, since, since we are p-chemists and we worry about excited, think about excited states, for my molecular uh, uh, spectroscopy background, I think about gee, how interesting it is to think of this in terms of a higher energy state for this system. And how does that cause molecules to be very different at the surface in this kinetically stable state versus when it relaxes then to the thermodynamically stable state? So uh, to me, that's, uh, that's kind of key to be able to try to understand these systems. How do the molecules orient and structure differently when they're in this geometry where, they're, where you're making them do something. <laughs> it's that you're making them do something because at the planar interface, they can just you know, hang out and go to the interface, but you're not making them hold this droplet together. Okay, so how do the surface property compare for these two uh, states? 
Okay, so I'm going to focus on two studies uh, today. I'm going to focus first on uh, what I call low charge nanomotions, and those are ones that you aren't actively adding any type of a surfactant to them. Uh, and then the second one area I'm going to talk about has to do with um, uh, suddenly got the world got more complex, and this is now studying nanomotions, which are a mixture of surfactants and polymers. And for example, a, a polymer coated nanomotion like this with its surfactant and polymer is one which you would oftentimes see using in drug delivery. So we're not, we're not doing drugs here, uh, but we are trying to understand stabilization of these, uh, of these nanomotions with this complex uh, mixture. Okay, so the experimental toolkit, um, we wanna know the sizes of these droplets. We wanna know the stability. So in this case, we use dynamic light scattering. We make the, we make the samples uh, and then do the uh, measurement. And then we can watch, for example, how stable they are over time um, uh, and so it's, it's really important for us to be able to do this kind of measurement and also get the dispersion of the sizes uh, too. So dynamic light scattering for these. Um, and then we also do uh, measurements of electrophoretic mobility. And in this case, what we're measuring with these, uh, these studies is the surface charge, basically getting a, a, a surface charge on the outside of that droplet. And so that allows us to get some idea of whether the, the molecules are there or not there. Because we can't, in, for this, these droplet surfaces, we can't do what we traditionally have done, which is to do surface pressure measurements. Now we know, for example, if you have an air water or an oil water interface and you put some kind of a surfactant there, in general, the surface tension goes down. And so, uh, and, but the pendant, this is a pendant drop tensiometer, uh, even though it's got a bulb on the bottom of it, which is what allows us to measure the surface tension, or we can also do it by the Wilhelmy plate. Um, we're still looking at a planar interface because the size of this drop is huge. But the point is with the, the nice thing with uh, the surface tension is it tells you that you've got molecules there and you can get some idea of an estimate of how many you've got there, which our spectroscopy is difficult to do. But we can't do the surface pressure measurements on the little droplets. And so that's why we, we use a combination of doing the studies on the planar interface to find out if something's going to absorb there at all. And then we also then on the droplet surface, we do zeta potential because it'll tell us whether there's something there that is charged. And in this case, uh, many of the things that we use are charged because uh, charge can stabilize the interface. Okay, and then we do um, spectroscopy. Many of you are uh, likely familiar with this. We're doing a vibrational spectroscopy of molecules at this oil water interface, in this case, the planar interface, where you have a tunable infrared beam and a fixed visible beam that you uh, put on the surface. And then if, and if the, you have broken inversion symmetry at the surface, what's above looks different than what's below, then that's the possibility of generating the second order phenomena which is a small amount of light that comes off that's the sum of those two frequencies. Now, so it's very interface specific, but, what the, but the more interesting thing from a spectroscopy point of view is that per, that signal that I have here, which looks like purple here, is extraordinarily weak. And so the way that it gets enhanced is, for example, if you are tuning over the infrared vibration with the infrared light, you're tuning over the vibrational mode of the molecule. If you hit a resonance, then the intensity is going to be enhanced and come back down when you're past that resonance. So it allows us to measure a, a vibrational spectrum of the molecules at the surface by looking at the change in intensity of this very weak uh, beam that's coming off. Now, uh, the modes, though, they have to be both Raman and I are active. So just because, so we're always on the lookout. So the spectroscopy in that respect is interesting in itself, because if you think about it, if you have your table and it shows which modes are uh, Raman and infrared active, that may not be the case for, for a surface. So you never quite know if the selection rules might be different if you're sitting at a surface, molecules are sitting at a surface rather than bulk. And so that's why I think that's really an important area of development with uh, vibrational sound frequency to really understand a little bit more in that area uh, also. Okay, so then for doing it, so that's what's done on the planar surface. So then for the nanomotion surface, we do the same thing. This is again, uh, what Sylvie Roki has really pioneered. And in this case, a visible and an IR beam again at the surface, but now the light is going to be scattered. Uh, and you're going to collect the light uh, um, with your detector and uh, 
you know, worry about different angles and geometries, just as we've done before with the planar sy system. But it's a little trickier because now you've got a scattering geometry and a weaker signal and so forth um, to be able to collect uh, rather than just more of a directed sum frequency. But all the rules are still there. Um, and uh, the molecules need to be at the interface. They need to have a net orientation. And the size of the molecules at, uh, and uh, the characteristics of the, uh, sorry, of the nanomotions um, allow you to not have a cancellation on both sides of this droplet so that you're not going to get any signal at all. But those are in the, uh, more in the details. Okay, so now I'm ready to jump right in. So starting at the bottom. So now we're gonna go really simple. It's good to go really simple before you go really complex. I think that's a rule of life, not just for this. So um, I'm going to call this uh, bare or low charge nanomotions, and you'll understand why in just a minute. So we wanted to be able to understand, uh, since we've done a lot of work with the planar interface, what the difference is between, and particularly, as I'll talk about, an inter planar interface that doesn't have any uh, surfactants there. We wanted to understand if we had uh, minimal adsorption at the surface, does it look at the droplet? Is there any difference in bonding of the molecules at this droplet surface as you would have the planar? So we have an aqueous phase of water. In this case, our hydrophobic phase uh, is hexadecane. Now, many of the studies we've done in the laboratory over the years have been done for the planar, have been done with carbon tet. And we've done that because then you could get the infrared beams uh, easily into the sample. Um, but in this case, this is with uh, hexadecane. Okay. Now, so in new, and so there's been a lot of work that's been done on these uh, nanomotions where you don't add any surfactant. So uh, BD has certainly worked in this area. Uh, and also uh, Roki's group has been working in this area too. And so something very curious uh, uh, has been reported in these studies and very curious and interesting to understand. And that is that even in neutral pH conditions, they find from their electrophoretic mobility measurements, uh, zeta potential measurements, that there's this inherent charge at the surface. And so there's been a curiosity as to what that charge could possibly be due to. Why would something that, it, it, what, what would possibly cause water next to oil to have a negative charge there? And so there are studies that Vidi, for example, has done with the pH dependence. And so, what they, and so this is the zeta potential now. So this is basically the charge of the surface. And uh, doing these pH measurements, uh, they find that actually when you are on a very high pH, you have a pretty negative uh, zeta potential. But then as you go to up to a lower pH, you get closer to uh, zero. However, um, also, uh, uh, the, if, you go too, uh, if you go too far in pH and it becomes, it, uh, it, basically, this suggests that the nanomotions now are no longer stable below pH of three for these studies where they did bare nanomotions. And so it appeared as if the, the um, charge just sort of went away when you went a lot more acidic. Uh, but nevertheless, they could certainly measure a zeta potential throughout this uh, range. So um, we were very uh, curious about this um, and wanted to think about what are the options that have been out there in the literature as possibilities for this innate charge. So could it be simply that there's hydroxide ions that, comes from, that come from the water that tend to aggregate at that surface and that has some pH dependence with it? or the possibility of ordered water dipoles that could create a field there that would draw uh, ions to the surface. And the other possibility is there might be some trace impurities uh, that are there that, that, uh, that's really hard to get rid of and they may be at the interface and causing this, uh, this very negative charge that was there. Well, of course, this was, this is, was exactly in our, our wheelhouse to be able to look at a bare interface. And so we got started trying to understand which one of these uh, it was. And, and no one's been able to see, for example, the spectral signatures of hydroxide. And so we went after that uh, as others. So let me just back up for a minute now, because now we wanted to uh, attack this by using some frequency spectroscopy. So if we go back uh, for many years of, of work that we've done in the laboratory, and this is actually the sum frequency spectrum of water at the oil water interface. This is the carbon tet water interface. And you find this very sharp peak um, corresponding to the free OH mode. And that is water molecules where they have one OH going into the oil and one OH going into the water. 
And then you have these broader uh, water spectrum, which has to do with uh, waters that are uh, complex together, two or three other water molecules, and then collective behavior. So a lot of water. This gets more towards bulk water. So as you, as you, uh, with I should say, with the OH stretches uh, of water, um, they're weaker uh, up in this region. There's very little bonding interaction, and in fact, this is so weak. This bond is uh, indicates the very weak bonding between other water molecules. In fact, nothing else bonded to it uh, because this OH is energetically uncoupled from this OH. So anyway, you get the this wonderfully sharp uh, free OH that's here. And then this showing more the coordinated water in the first 10 angstroms of the, of the surface. And interestingly, that this, this, is a, this frequency right here it is sens very sensitive to um, the different organic phases you might look, so look at, for example. So if you put uh, the alkanes uh, there, you'll see a different kind of a frequency than you get from this free OH with carbon tet or uh, CHCl3, uh, it's gonna be different too. So as the, as the interface, as the water becomes, uh, uh, water actually is, we, what we learned from this is that water at this interface actually bonds weakly to the oil. I should say that in the beginning because at the air water interface, this is actually red shifted. So at the air water interface, you get the free OH about here. And then as you get more polar, this free OH moves down. And so, uh, what we and so we wanted to do is to see: Do we see this at uh, at this nano emulsion surface? Because it uh, this last one uh, point that I have here, because this whole spectrum is incredibly sensitive to the presence of surface impurities. So, if you have any surface impurities, uh, any significant surface impurities, and this would be the sort of the nanomolar range, um, this free OH begins to diminish and the water bands get huge because you've got a lot of uh, impurities are usually charged. But, F, and, and so we know what it looks like when there's uh, some impurities there. And I tell you, we've worked years to figure out the, 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 the process by which you can get a really clean uh, interface. And so that's why we wanted to use those practices to see if we could see this similar, similar free OH at this bare nanomotion surface. And then what was the charge uh, to if we could see that. Okay, so uh, if we look at, uh, when we do these experiments then, what we find is how low can you go? So let me uh, take this, uh, let me see if I can, got this kind of popping in early. Okay, so for this particular system, what we, I'm gonna move, oh, I can't move that. This isn't gonna be so easy. Just a minute, let me go back, sorry. Because what, we're, what we don't wanna be seeing is that one of the important point is actually behind this little guy. So let me go back for a minute. And this is sort of the punchline. So here, here I'm gonna uh, stop for a second. You guys can see that uh, uh, you can actually watch it being, uh, spinach, uh, spinach being made, sausage being made. Okay, so let's see if we can get this. Anyway, I'm, I'm just gonna go ahead and go. Okay, now, so now most of, the, most of the measurements that found a negative charge on them ended up in this range. So the literature values that say nanomotions are negatively charged innately end up in this range here. However, we were able to get our nanomotions in this range using the procedures we've used over all these years with the planar interface. So let me tell you how to get your glassware clean in order to do these experiments. So what we found out was that if you uh, take your clean water to see how you could end up with this, these literature values that are at 50, about 50 to 80, minus 50 to 80 uh, millivolts. So if you uh, take your clean, our clean water that's up here and you uh, put it in a polyethylene container to store it, it ends up with surface charge, nanomotion surface charge in this range. If you uh, take your glassware, uh, if you take uh, your glassware and you don't, you use an acid bath you've used before in cleaning it, then you're gonna end up in this range. If you use a fresh acid bath every single time, then you're going to end up in this range. So those are sort of the tricks that we've, uh, got, we've gotten used to doing in order to do the planar uh, interface. And we, again, we have a way of monitoring that because we know what the free OH and relative to the bonding water molecule should uh, look like if it's really clean. So now we wanted to see if we could see something like that on these uh, nanomotion uh, surfaces. Now that we have these low charge 
nanomotions now that we have these low charge nanomotions. What are their surface characteristics? Okay, so um, now we're in hexadecane now versus uh, carbon tet, which I just showed you before. And what we this is just some, some previous work that we've done at the planar interface. And you can see for this kind of a spectrum, it's actually quite different than what I showed you for the free OH uh, of the carbon tet water in that the bonding is actually, the free OH is actually broader and we know that by doing modeling that, that, hex, that these alkanes just interact differently with the water, a uh, couple different types of or, uh, orientations and interactions. And that the fact that the, the, the free OH is actually blue shifted from carbon tet, carbon tet is a lot more polarizable. But we know that if we're going after hexadecane, it's, it, we're gonna have to find something for a free OH that looks something like this. Okay, and that was a lot of work. So uh, uh, one day when we were, at group meeting and I, um, we were talking about, and Andrew Carpenter who's done a lot of this nano motion work and also uh, Jen Hensel. Um, at group meeting, I said, you know, for me, the holy grail would be to be able to see that free OH. Uh, I, I know it, it would be really hard and it may not be there because if, you know, if it's hydroxide that's causing, it, you know, it may not be there, but, and I know it's a hard experiment, but it's really the holy grail. And uh, so Andrew was working on this and he said, well, let's, we have to reduce the IR absorption uh, that gets through the, the aqueous phase. And so the way to do that is to actually do a mixture of, of H2O and D2O. And we've done that uh, many years ago when we were working on, uh, on the air water interface to use what we would call isotopic dilution. And you end up with HOD uh, molecules, which actually allow you to then be able to get the frequency of this OD mode uh, without as much water uh, absorption as before. And that's what we needed to go after, was to see if we could do it using this mixture, if we could see the free OD uh, on these low charge nanomotions. And indeed, there it is. And, uh, and so I had gone off a trip someplace and I came back and he had done it. Um, and so what you see here is this is, the, this is now for nanomotions that are about 600 millivolts. They have a zeta potential of minus 10 millivolts, which is, again is different than literature values, which are more in the order of minus uh, 50 to 80. Um, and what, this is the unnormalized spectrum, the top one, which is sharper. And then, um, lost my arrow. And then you've got the, uh, this weak signal here that I always say spectra like this, this is a spectra that only a mother could love <laughs> because it's really there, but it's just uh, only a mother could love. Um, but nevertheless, it's there. And so, um, and uh, we published that work and we're very excited about it, but we also had to do some more work to figure out what was going on with regards to this, this, uh, this free OH because we knew um, from the past studies that frequency is an indicator of the bonding interaction between the oil and the water, okay? So we wanted to be able to compare it with the hexadecane water with the things we've done planar and see what that, how that frequency uh, compared. Uh, oh, I should also say that for uh, samples that have a zeta potential of minus 40 to 60, uh, something in that range, uh, this peak disappears. So you have to have it down in this minus 10 millivolt range in order to even see it. So you have to have gone through the rigorous procedure in order to see it. Okay, so this is now comparing the planar D2O carbon tet, planar H2O, uh, HOD carbon tet. And you can see that their frequencies are, are here. And again, we're hexadecane. So there certainly is a, a frequency shift relative to carbon tet, but again, you're hexadecane. So uh, that's uh, in many respects, not so surprising. But more interesting though, was then what we, when we compare it to the planar hexadecane water, which we were able to uh, do by looking at some uh, different work that we've done before and extrapolating, that what you actually see is this 3OD at the nanomotion surface is actually redshifted from what it is at the planar interface. And so uh, we believe that that is contributing to helping uh, the stabilization, not as strongly as a surfactant would, but it, it, it certainly is indicative of a stronger bonding between the water and the oil at this nanomotion surface when it's in its kinetically stable state versus the planar interface. So really proud of that, uh, of that work. So, um, but then we, we still really wanted to be able to understand uh, what the pH dependence of our samples were uh, relative to what people had measured uh, with, as I showed you, the pH dependence of the electrophytic mobility. 
uh, from the more highly charged, but still low charge uh, nano emulsions. Because I'm not saying these, uh, these were full of junk. This is still, we're talking about tiny, tiny traced amounts of impurities that would give you that uh, minus 50 to 60 uh, millivolt. So this is what we got. So you see, it certainly goes down. Uh, it's certainly low. Uh, goes down and then goes back up again uh, in terms of uh, the um, uh, the electrophoretic mobility, and then they fall apart. Now, how long do these nano emulsions last? They last several days, but you know you're not going to make mayonnaise out of them. They're uh, they they do uh, coalesce and, and go away and eventually disappear. So, uh, but we're not the first one to wonder whether it was impurities in this nano emulsion system that gives it its negative uh, value. In fact, there's some really nice work that's been done uh, before us by Roger and, who, by, and, and company. And what they found they were doing, you can see here, the green is using hexadecane that's not, not the purest as you can get, which is 99% uh, uh, hexadecane. Um, this is, sorry, the green is the purest, a little less pure, and then with uh, octanoic acid added to it. And you can see that this now with a, a little bit of octanoic acid, you can see that this actually mimics more the uh, pH dependence of the, of, um, of the early, the BD work that I talked about. But, um, and so this was, they had, this was not just yesterday, it was uh, 2012 that they had found this. So we, we were happy to see this. Now, why, why is it with octanol? Well, the reason is that many impurities that are in your water, unless you're uh, drinking, you know, uh, mud water, um, many of the impurities, even in, uh, for, use for the uh, relatively clean samples, really are uh, something that has carboxylic acids in them. And so, you know, because there's humic acid uh, breaks down into different carboxylic acids and so forth. So, so the reason that they chose octanoic acid uh, was because it would uh, likely mimic something that you would find uh, in, as an impurity. And so, um, and, and so that certainly uh, gave us further um, support for the fact that this negative charge could actually be something like impurities. So, and in this case then, if you, uh, if you don't memorize the pH dependence of the, these fatty acids, um, in this region, you have a, a combination. In this region, you have just the, the protonated and then you have the deprotonated. And that's what you're actually seeing is this deprotonation of the acid. And actually, Mark Foster, who's working in my group now is doing a lot of detailed studies with fatty acids. Fatty acids. He's getting really interesting data on, this, uh, on the system and combination. Okay, so what else have we learned from this? Well, um, we also, I, I also should say I didn't because it was at the bottom of my screen, um, going back to this, um, actually back to the spectrum. Um, we also have done uh, experiments. There's a recent paper um, by the Roki group that, that suggested you, your spectrum might have artifacts in them if you don't take into account the absorption of other of nano motions that your, that your beam is going through. And we just put out a paper on that that has all the, I don't know if I might have it listed later, that, that shows that this doesn't affect, uh, in fact, it makes the signal stronger to take into account that, uh, that absorption. Oops, going wrong way. Okay, so let's go back to this guy. Okay, so, um, the previous uh, work uh, by Roki's group had said that had uh, said that when you um, uh, what when you have um, this bare nano emulsion surface with uh, the charge on it that you actually get very strong uh, CH mode signals uh, because that's what uh, CH mode so uh, sorry that you from the hexadecane I should say this experiment is done now it, the others were done with deuterated hexadecane. This now is done with uh, hydrogenated hexadecane, negatively charged bare nano motions, and, um, and they saw a strong signal. But we see nearly no, almost no signal from the CH modes for these nano motions. So we don't see the kind of CH, and this is a CH region, and we don't see that those kind of strong CH modes when we have these uh, nano motions. Uh, in fact, we only, this is again hexadecane. We only see the CH modes come in when we add a little bit of carboxylic acid surfactant there. And then uh, in this case, and there's deuterated surfactant. In this case, what you actually see is the more that you add of the uh, carboxylic acid there, the more alignment you see in the hexadecane. 
So the fact that hexadecane for these nanomotions actually uh, doesn't show much signal, it's still there, but it means that it's randomly oriented. Or if you follow the work of the Brookhaven group and, and others, it's actually uh, aligned more parallel to the interface. And in this case, we're monitoring perpendicular to the interface. So our results that you have uh, almost no signal uh, from the hexadecane when you, have, uh, uh, when you have these zeta potential of minus 10 under these conditions. Uh, is consistent with their work that suggests that you, um, are, you aren't going to see alignment of these hexadecane until you add something to it. And in this case, we used um, uh, three different surfactants, uh, and you, which I have for color coded here. And it doesn't matter which one you have, you still have this. You're adding zeta potentials, the zeta potentials are higher for these, but you also, these surfactants also aid in aligning um, the surfactants that's there, that are there. We've also done recent experiments too to try to find out the impact of a charge. Does it charge on one side of the nanomotion impact how the be behavior of the other side of the nanomotion? And for these particular studies with AOT, we find that they, it really doesn't uh, affect one side or the other. Okay, so these again, I should have said earlier, but these are the methyl and methylene uh, modes. Okay, so to sum up um, these bare uh, nanomotions, uh, we have a low zeta potential, and we believe that that's a result of uh, being able to, uh, because we have this experiments, experience, be able to minimize uh, the impurities that are there. And that this is supported, uh, and the fact that we have these uh, nanomotions that have, then you can actually get this free OH there, it uh, indicates that you're, uh, you do have the water oscillator there. Now, do we think we have perfectly pure samples? No, <laughs> no, we don't. Uh, because those nanomotions, to be stable, they have to have a charge there. They have to have a charge, you have to have something to stabilize them, because otherwise they're, and, and it's that negative charge that, that has to be there. So, as, as, you know, we're not perfect either. So there's charges there because we have impurities too, but it's just at the lowest level. And the, the, but, the, but the interesting thing about this from our perspective, because we've worked for so many years and trying to understand these frequency shifts with water with different hydrophobic media, is that it looks as if the water bonding interaction between the he hexadecane and, and water is stronger than you would find at the linear interface. And then as far as the hexadecane uh, molecules, they generally lie parallel to the surface, but once you put a surfactant there, they start to uh, align with each other probably because most likely because of the fact you've got a little bit of a field there uh, due to the charge species at the surface, that negatively charge of the molecule that's there positive. And that helps in the alignment, hydrophobic interactions that can cause this kind of uh, alignment that's there. Okay, so now onward to more complex system. Now we're gonna get gooey uh, indeed. So, um, and in this case, what we're doing is we're looking at polymer assembly at the nano droplet surface. And in this case, what we're looking at is a more complex uh, system. Just a minute. Okay. Uh, 540. 540. Okay, sorry. Um, that was the husband, by the way, it wasn't child. Um, arranging a time for the next Zoom call. Okay, so anyway, the, um, that distracted me. My husband always distracts me. Okay back to real life or away from real life and back to this. Okay, so um, in this case, we're really interested in understanding how these molecules absorb on these droplet surface when you have a mixture of surfactants and polymers. And so, and there's a lot of, there's of course a lot of interest in this because of the very, many of the uses for nanomotions have to do with a combination of surfactants and polymers. It's only us, you know, us physical chemists that get excited about nothing being there, uh, we get excited about it, but they get more excited about what happens when you put these, these different molecules and surfactants there and how, how do they behave? One of, the, one of the curious things about this is that oftentimes they act, interact very synergistically. So that if one, uh, one of them being there might cause a lot more of the other to absorb than if it were just there by itself. But again, for these nanomotions, it's not just like the planar interface where you, they just go there and, and hang out and might interact. They have to interact in a way that will stabilize the nanomotion. So as I just went through before, you've got to have some kind of charge there. It could be positively charged too, but you've got to have some kind of charge there to, make, to, to keep the different droplets next to each other from coalescing. You know, you've got to have the charge there so the neighbor doesn't uh, coalesce with you. And that's a lot of the reason for the 
the importance of the charge, which I didn't know before, but it should have. It's very important. So in this case, then, um, for these studies, we're using uh, sodium to decal sulfate, and then I'll do, I'll talk a little bit about a DTAB too. And then this polymer, polyethylene amine. And we like this polymer because it, you can, the surfactant is clearly charged, um, but the polymer then, you can change the pH to change its charge. So you can get to, you can start to understand the electrostatic interactions uh, between the surfactant and the, and the polymer, but also then the hydrophobic interactions because you're going to have those also. And if, if, if you do realize this is an idealized uh, uh, image here. <laughs> Nature isn't quite so ordered. So the project is to develop an understanding of the molecular synergies between the, the surfactant and the polymer. And in this case, we're using PEI because we can have it be acidic, so it's positively charged. We can have it be basic and have it be neutral. And of course, then we can put the surfactant in there, which I'll mostly focus on uh, in the last few minutes talking about sodium dodecyl sulfate, and then uh, say a few words about what we find with DTAP when you change the charge on the surfactant. Okay. And the question is, what role does the surface charge play in this? And that's why we're playing with the, the pH too. Okay, so now we're just gonna do PEI alone. And I'm gonna start out by saying PEI alone will not form stable nanomotions. And so no matter what the pH is. However, we can do surface tension measurements on a planar interface and see it if, if it ever goes there as a function of pH. And so what we find in that case, what we find in that case is that um, under acidic conditions, um, you, the surface tension uh, down here, there's very little change in the surface tension. So it's, it might be there, but not very much. However, when you go to more basic conditions where now the surfactant loses its, the polymer loses its charge, it actually goes there pretty weakly, but it will actually go there. But it's, it doesn't, uh, because it doesn't have a charge on it, it's not going to form a stable nanomotion. So it, it'll go, the, it, it, so again, I'm trying to distinguish between the, the two because this case we can measure that it's there, but if it's not going to form stable nanomotions, then we can't use it. So does it absorb? And so we do see that it does absorb at the planar water interface, but doesn't it at the nanomotion? All right, so now let's, let's mix them together. So now we've got here, we're gonna go back here, and this is surface pressure again. We're gonna go back here, and this is PEI, and this brown trace here, that's SDS alone, okay? With this small concentration. And what you find is when you mix them, it really affects the surface pressure. So they're there. Um, they are certainly there. And they, in fact, there's a synergy going on that makes the SDS and PEI or, or, or one or the other go there very, uh, very strongly, which they didn't alone. So now what about the zeta potential measurements? Okay, well, there, that's where we're now, we can see now, wherever there's a dot, you know that we've been able to form a stable nanomotion. So if we look here, um, when you've got uh, SDS and PEI, now this is positive, zeta potential, which is positive. And remember at the low pH, PEI is positively charged and then it goes neutral. And so as you add, and this is, so SDS can form nanomotions by themselves. And this is the pH dependence. You wouldn't just expect to see too much pH dependence alone because it's uh, uh, sulfate. Okay, so, but what you see here is actually, as you go to more basic conditions, you actually then, I've got my stuff in the way, you actually then get to the point at which you go negative. So you're positive here. Think about this as the PEI has got to be there to have this positive charge on it. But you go down here now, PEI gets neutral, and now your nanomotions have a negative charge on them. So they're dominated now by the, the negative charge of the uh, SDS that's there. Okay. So now let's go to the spectroscopy and see what we can learn from the spectroscopy. Okay, so now we, we got them together and we're under acidic conditions. And in this case then, uh, what, we, uh, what we can see is that if we have just, now we, can't, we don't deuterate the polymer, that's beyond my budget. Uh, we don't deuterate the polymer, but on the other hand, if we put, we use hydrogen, we just do the hydrogenated SDS alone, then what you actually get then are the CH modes of the SDS. Okay? You get the CH modes of the SDS, trying to find out who's there uh, under acidic conditions. And then if you, um, if you then uh, deuterate the SDS and you have PEI that's there, um, 
you see that PEI uh, is disordered. So we, we know that PEI is there. We could see that from the zeta potential. However, and it's not ordered at all. And so at this, under these conditions, it's not ordered. However, then when you, for the purple, then what happens is that you, um, in this case, what you've got is um, you've got a stronger signal with, with the hydrogen. Now you aren't deuterated. Now you've got the hydrogen there too. So you actually have more, you still got PEI disordered, or, but what you've got is you've, it really draws more SDS to the interface. So more, more of that with the PEI there, it actually enhances uh, the SDS to go to the interface. So there's some synergy there, as you might expect, because you've got this positive charge on the polymer and you've got this negative charge on the SDS. But it still doesn't look as if you're causing much change in the ordering. But again, there's the CH modes, it's hard, you can't distinguish the CH modes from the SDS from the PEI. But we do know that it's certainly, uh, there's a synergy going on to uh, cause them both to go. Okay, so now let's go basic. Now let's go basic. Um, and in this case, then, we actually find as you go more basic, and again, you've, you've deprotonated the, the uh, polymer, but you've still got the charge on the SDS. This is, these are now the peaks from the uh, polymer. So at pH, and, and because this is deuterated SDS, so now the polymer decides it's going to order. And so when, and as you go to low, more, uh, um, more negative uh, uh, to higher and higher pHs, you actually get more PEI ordering around this, uh, this uh, nanomotion, helping to stabilize it again. And so, uh, and, and so again, when you had it where, where both of them were charged, you didn't see the order. But in this case, when only the SDS is charged, then you see this growing signal. And so this is, for example, the signal of PEI uh, plus SDS. Uh, hydrogenated and then PEI plus deuterated. So you certainly see a much stronger PEI signal there because it's ordered too. And you know this is this is really a fun experiment because um, there haven't been some frequency experiments like this before. And so to be able to get this kind of information about the stability and the ordering as a function of charge and electrostatic interactions and hydrophobicity, uh, the paper goes into much uh, detail about that. And so the big picture conclusions from this are when you're acidic, the PEI, oh, it's kind of hanging out, uh, but the SDS is certainly there, and it's got different degrees of, of ordering of the chains. Um, and then you, uh, but when you go basic for the PDI and the SDS, when you go basic, then you have much nicer uh, structuring around this, uh, of the polymer around the surface, and you then also have uh, SDS uh, that is there. Now, uh, I mentioned that we did DTAB because we wanted to see the difference between the cationic surfactant. And in this case, when we put the DTAB there, um, you don't see any polymer at all at the low pH, at the acidic pH. Um, and you do get uh, ordering with the, uh, when you go to the basic pH. So you've got some hydrophobic, hydrophobic interactions going on here. But the fact that you've got, a, uh, you've got some uh, interactions too, a little bit of a, still a little bit of a polymer uh, positive charge there. And then the positive uh, charge of the DTAP means that it's just, it explains why you don't normally see people making uh, PEI and DTAP uh, in these polymer systems. Okay, so that's to, to sum up uh, where we've been uh, in this talk, focused largely on two, uh, two different systems, sort of the extreme, two extreme sides. Um, we have the low charge nanomotions where I talked to you about the fact that we're trying to get detailed information about what happens when you have uh, this oil and water and what happens when you add a little bit more, these nanomotions, what happens when you add a little more charge there? Um, and how does that then alter uh, not only the, the water, but also the uh, oil phase? And uh, looking by looking at the free OH or the free OD in this case, and then uh, the fact that as you add uh, the hexadecane is affected also by adding some kind of a charge there that can interact with the uh, tails. And then uh, threw in uh, polymers and surfactants, showing that the charge makes a big difference. And uh, we played around with that by changing the pH, but that you can find ideal conditions to form these really stable uh, nanomotions. And uh, the credit, this is obviously pre-COVID. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I had to say that so you didn't think we were going to get kicked off of our campus where you can't be on campus without your masks on. But I really want to point out in particular, I want to point out Andrew right here, who just uh, completed his thesis in the group a few months ago. And then uh, I'd also like to point out Emma, who has done uh, the polymer work uh, for this paper. And, um, and I thank you all, and I thank the people that provide us with the money. The Department of Energy is funding us for, the, uh, for a lot of the basic studies that we did, uh, and the National Science Foundation for the work that we're starting on with Mark uh, right here, which has to do with studying more detail of these carboxylic acids that we sort of added as, as impurities. So it's a great group. We all look forward to getting back together again in person, as I'm sure all of you wish you could uh, too. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll finish and just say, if I don't get a chance to say, say it later, uh, everybody stay healthy and get those vaccines. All right, thank you. Thanks so much, Sherry, that was great. Um, so just a reminder for everybody, what we're gonna do here is um, behind the scenes, uh, the panelists have been um, curating the questions and Professor Rodrigo Noriega from Utah and Professor Carlos Baez No from, uh, from uh, the I'm, University I'm, of Texas and uh, Pro Professor McCoy, I'm sorry, are going to help curate the questions, my bad. And then we're gonna curate those questions from everybody um, and then after the everybody questions are over with, we're gonna have, we're gonna kick all the faculty out. And if you're a grad student and, or a postdoc and would like to interact more directly with Professor Richmond, we're gonna take a little bit of time uh, and do that at the end. So um, who wants to go first here in terms of questions? Carl why don't uh, you start? Okay, so um, there are a number of questions. Um, thank you again, very nice seminar. The, uh, I'll ask the first question. Um, for hexadecane and surfactant, can you address the causes for lo what looks like strong shifts among these surfactants? Is it charge or density? You mean, the, uh, does uh, the, the shift in the, the water? Uh, that's I, right. Yeah, I think that's what the, the question is asking. Um, yeah. I think it's actually the, well, you know, that's actually a good question because we've talked about it in terms of the, uh, the bonding uh, interaction between the hexadecane, but in that case, uh, it's already shifted. You may not be able to follow me. That's a really good question. I actually haven't thought about that before. Uh, would it depend upon density? Um, and um, that'd be, a, I'd probably get murdered if I asked my students to do a concentration dependence with that kind of a signal to noise. But, but that's actually a, an interesting question as to whether, um, if, it's really, if it's really helping to stabilize, um, what would that look like as you, would there be some kind of a shift if you uh, went to a higher density? So thank you for that question. That'll just yeah. hang out in my mind for a lot longer. Uh, yeah, I had the same question when you were describing this, whether it's a sylvatochromic shift or, or if there are actual interactions, right? It sounds like your interpretation is in, in terms of interactions, but there could be a pretty strong component from the sylvatochromic shift. That's right, that's right. Well, but yeah. we've, we've, uh, Carlos, we've studied things like that you know, to try to understand it before. And it's just not in the, the range of that. And so um, we, uh, uh, that we eliminated. We also, you know, this concern that, uh, that uh, Sui Roki had raised, which is a, it's a really beautiful paper about the worry that your uh, shift might be reflective of the fact that you've got a medium that has nanomotions in it that are absorbing, you know, they, they could be absorbing the light. And, and so we were really happy to, to be able to show that wasn't the case for this system, but it really gives a, uh, guidelines for others that are doing this work to pay attention to to that factor in addition to what you're talking about too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have the next question and my mic is on. Um, so this one's from Joseph Shirley and the question is, do you think the acid-base differences of the polymer surfactant systems could be used in drug delivery? Um, are, there, are they already used there? Oh, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, is it Joe? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank you for that question, Joe, because I wondered that too. Um, because if you think about your, your, the pH of your stomach being one or two, um, for those of you that just ate lunch or something, you're like <laughs> gurgling down there. Um, and then, you know, the rest of your body being a, a pH of the, of the blood. Um, I, I, I don't know enough about uh, drug design, but I, I have to believe 
and, and, and I have to I have to be honest too that part of this is driven by the fact to understanding conditions under which they're stable and they come apart because if you're doing the drug delivery you want it to go to the right place and I don't know if they design it you know so that if it's for example going to the stomach you put something in there that destabilizes when it's really acidic so sorry I don't have a better answer to that but you certainly it's certainly something that I find very curious I have to say that that this this whole idea I said before that a lot of the group things that we do in the group is very environmentally oriented but it's really Emma that said she wanted to uh, delve more into this uh, this area and so it's to her credit for us going there and uh, so she may actually know a little bit more about that than I do Okay, the next question is from uh, Dana Glickman and says, I have a question about the order of the SC SDS with respect to the oil. You draw the SDS uh, with the change showing towards kind of the middle of, of the micelle, but the group of uh, Sylvia Roki showed that it would lay differently. Uh, could you comment on that? I think that this question is related to the fact that there's been some papers from Sylvie's group showing that uh, in certain surfactants, especially if you have a double bond, right? If you have an unsaturation, you can get this, this surfactant to lay kind of flat across the interface. Yeah, I, uh, I can't really say. Uh, the point is that um, all, all we know is that we get the, when we put a little bit of charge there, such as with the carboxylic acid there, that, the, that you go from a hexadecane not showing any uh, order whatsoever. And then when you put a little bit of a charge there, it, it starts to uh, orient. The hexadecane does, but I haven't. Uh, we haven't done any more details uh, than that because what we were really most interested in and in seeing is if for these low charge nanomotions, where you start out with something that's that low, uh, that how does it uh, how is the ordering affected? So I completely believe that there would be there could be a significant difference with when you put different surfactants there that might have a double chain or something like that. But again, you've got to start out with a nano, for our case, you've got to start out with a nano motion that starts with a zeta potential that's, that's in the minus 10 uh, range. Thank you. Okay, the next question is from Paul Garrett and it says, have you tried using a surfactant that isn't charged? Would you still see interaction with a surfactant without mod modulating charges on the polymer and surfactant species. Okay, so let me add, do that one more time because it has So some... have you tried a surfactant that isn't charged? Okay, stop there. <laughs> yes, <okay. laughs> uh, we have at the planar interface, so we've done different alcohols at the planar, but uh, haven't been able to get any decent stabilization at the polymer. Sometimes you can use, uh, I should back up and then we'll go on. Uh, you can use an uncharged polymer um, because then uh, if you can get it to, to coat the nanomotion because of the interactions at the uh, interface, that it, because of steric hindrance, it would not coalesce. So you can still have something, um, you, you don't have to have a charge there in order for it to stabilize. You can use some kind of a, a, st a steric hindrance going on, but uh, you, uh, we haven't done anything uh, that's just purely uh, a polymer. Okay, now go on in. So I think you've answered the second half, which is would you see interaction with the surfactant without modulating charges on the polymer and surfactant species. Oh, yes, 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 yes. And so we have played with that with regards to surfactant and uh, uh, non-charged uh, polymer. And we can still get that to, we can go to, get that to go. And it's still the same, it's sort of the same result as having uh, PEI when it's uncharged with the uh, uh, surfactant, with, but it's with the charged surfactant. Okay, the next question is from Amber Kremel. Um, Amber asked, I am wondering if you have observed any ordering of water near the charged polymer nanoemulsion interfaces. No, that's harder to, uh, it's harder for us to get those uh, spectra for these particular systems, but we can do that more for the reverse uh, nanoemulsions. And so we have done some work in that area on the AOT with regards to uh, looking at the water behavior, because in that case, the water is stuck in a little droplet and we don't have to, it's not so difficult to get the IR through it. So Amber, look at the, I don't remember the details of it, but uh, look at the, um, uh, our AOT, PNAS paper on AOT and it has those results. Great, so the next question is from Eric Bourget and he asks, he says, great talk and wonderful insights. His question is, what is the size dependence? And in particular, by varying the SFG scattering angle, this should enable you to probe the interfaces of emulsion particles by varying their size. 
we haven't done and we haven't so okay so the one thing we've done eric in that area is um to try to understand the uh this was to to take aot we did an experiment with aot uh stabilizing the nanomotion and aot chosen because of the uh, wonderful work that uh, Nancy Levenger and, and others have done uh, with uh, uh, emulsions. Um, anyway, and it's, uh, is it, so we take AOT and we let it grow. And we, we let it, you know, over days, we let it grow. And it would go from something like 200 nanometers, I think up to 800 nanometers before uh, it uh, went away. And actually for, and when, in that case, we were measuring uh, the CH modes of the uh, from the um, AOT, and interestingly, uh, anything that we did, I think we did the SO modes too of AOT. Anything that we did, the spectrum, uh, the spectra didn't change at all with size, which was very interesting. And especially because you might expect, as the nanomotion would grow, that maybe this, this at least the CH modes would would change. But we didn't see we didn't see any change with AOT as the nanomotion grew. So that's the most that we've done with regards to looking to see uh, if there were changes in size. Great, I guess uh, we have one more question. Christy, since we're on time, right? I'll just one more question here. Um, this last question is from Xiao Zheng. And um, this person asks, does the surface tension of low charge nano emulsion show stronger diameter dependence? Well, we can't do surface tension on the nano emulsions. Right, so we okay. can't, we can't, we, we can only use the zeta potential on the nano motions. So that's why, so I don't know how to answer okay. that. Just, yeah. Great. That's a lot of good questions. Wow, this is a Friday. <laughs> <laughs> you thought it was going to be an easy one, right? <laughs> yeah. no, those are great uh, questions. And, and we have some people from outside of the US who, for whom it's either very, very late or very, very early. Yep. Bye. <laughs> yeah, some of those questions were from international people, so oh, for nice. sure. Yeah. Um, so maybe I guess all of us, uh, at least the, the big group here, can thank Professor Richmond one more time for such a great talk and for sharing her time. And now, if you are faculty, we love you, but <laughs> go away. Jerry, if you want, you might stop sharing your slides yes, that would be so happy. we have a little bit more space to see your beautiful see background. You. <laughs>